Hello. In this podcast, we're going to explore the fundamentals of scientific investigations. We're going to look at how we design experiments, how we organize data, how we take that data and analyze it, and then how we answer the research questions by making claims that are supported with evidence. First, let's take a look at designing experiments, and that all begins with the research question. Because the goal of the investigation is to answer the research question or questions. We can't design an experiment without research questions. That's how vital they are to the design process. We write research questions to ask how a specific variable affects another specific variable. Let's look at the process for creating a research question. In this example, we want to understand the motion of a car going around the curve. So first, we want to think of things, also known as variables, that might affect its motion and can be measured. Things such as the car's mass, the car's tires, the car's velocity, road surface, friction force, and radius of the curve. Next, we want to write the RQ asking how one variable affects another. For example, a correctly written RQ would say, how does the car's velocity affect the friction force needed to stay on the road? An incorrect way of writing that is, how fast can the car go? This is incorrect because it doesn't list specific velocities such as, I mean specific variables such as velocity and friction force. Let's look at another one. How does the car's mass affect the friction force needed to stay on the road? An incorrect version of this would be, how does the car's mass make it stay on the road? Now, while this last one has a variable, mass, it doesn't say how it affects another variable. It just says stay on the road. Well, we can't measure stay on the road, but we can measure friction force. Now, let's talk about variables. Variables are quantities measured in experiments such as mass, velocity, and force. We need to identify and categorize these variables into three broad categories. The independent variable, it's purposely changed to determine how it affects another variable. If you ask yourself, can I pick the values of this variable? If you answer yes, then it's probably the independent variable. The next important variable is the dependent variable. We measure its response to changes in the independent variable. If you ask yourself, can we pick the values we want to test, and the answer is no, chances are this variable is the dependent variable. Finally, control variables are important. These are kept constant because they could affect the dependent variable. There can be more than one of them and we can pick the value we want to control. So if you can answer yes to this question, it's probably a control variable. And often they are the independent variable in a subsequent research question. So you do need to be careful when identifying independent variable and control variables because they are interchangeable. But remember, the research question is written with the independent variable affecting the dependent variable. So the control variables will be these important variables that can affect the dependent variable, but they're not part of the research question. Let's take a look at our sample research question. How does the car's velocity affect the friction force needed to stay on the road? The independent variable is velocity because it's doing the affecting. The dependent variable is friction force because it's the variable that's being affected. And then the control variables, if we think about it, the car's mass, the curve's radius, and the road's texture could also affect the friction force. So we need to keep them constant. Now let's take a look at writing an experimental procedure. The procedure guides how we perform the experiments. And an investigation can consist of many experiments. Uh, the definition of an experiment is something that has the same independent, dependent, and control variable throughout. So typically, each research question will require its own experiment. 
So step one in the process is we need to identify the independent, dependent, and control variables for each research question. Next, we need to determine how many trials to run. So a trial has one value for the independent variable. For instance, in our research question, the independent variable is velocity. So one value of velocity would be one trial. We want to run a minimum of five trials. Ideally, we'd run many more than this, but time is a limiting factor in our class. So we pick a minimum of five trials because five data points can identify a linear relationship. And we'll learn later on why that's something we're after. Finally, we want to pick a wide range of values. The largest value should be 100 times the smallest value, but that's not always possible. So in our class, we want to focus on having at least the largest value 10 times larger than the smallest value. The third step is we want to pick values for the control variables. These must be kept constant. Step four, we want to determine how many duplicate trials should be run. A duplicate trial is a trial that repeats the independent variable. So for instance, velocities are independent variable. If one of the trials we wanted to run was at 2 meters per second, if we ran a second trial at the same 2 meters per second, that would be a duplicate trial. So more duplicates gives us more confidence in the results, but takes more time to do the experiment. So if our measurements are accurate and our control variables kept constant, then we're not going to run any duplicate trials in this class because we have limited time. However, sometimes we'll have experiments where we can't accurately measure the uh, variables or we have trouble keeping the control variables constant. Then we'll need to run two duplicate trials for each value. Now that would mean a total of three trials for each value. The original trial plus two duplicates. Step five, create a data table for each experiment. If you aren't able to create a data table, then you aren't done planning the experiment. You don't have enough things figured out yet. So we're going to look next at how to format a data table. The reason we create data tables is to organize our data, accurately record measurements, identify trends in the data, and effectively communicate results to others. A data table is required for each, an exper for each experiment, so an investigation could have more than one data table. Here's an example of a data table for this example we're using between velocity and friction force. Let's look at some key functions of this table. First of all, the table is set up in columns. They go vertically and rows, which go horizontally. First, a table needs a title. And the title includes the table number. The first table in every report is table one, the second table is table two, and so on. It also needs a descriptive title. Now there's several ways to do this, but one of the easiest ways is to list the dependent variable versus the independent variable. So in this case, the dependent variable is friction force and the independent variable is velocity. So it's table one, friction force versus velocity. Another way to describe this could be table one, the effect of velocity on friction force. So again, more than one right way to do it, but if you're using the versus template, it's dependent variable versus independent variable. Next, let's take a look at our data columns. It does matter what order they are in left to right. The independent variable comes first then the dependent variable, and then after that comes the control variables. Going down the rows, it does matter in what order you list the data. We want to list the data in increasing order of the independent variable. Notice it goes in order from lowest trial, 5 meters per second, to the highest trial, 8 
80 meters per second. Or you could reverse this and you could go from highest to lowest, but it has to be in order. Next, let's talk about the column header. They are titles, so the first letter needs to be capitalized in each word. Also, we need to include the units. For instance, notice velocity, the units are meters per second. Notice that we do not put the units with the numbers. The reason we put the units up in the header is so the numbers can be clean and we're not distracted by looking at units beside every number. So when we put meters per second in the velocity column, everybody understands that every number in that column has units of meters per second. Let's talk about an alternative method for representing the control variables. In our table, we had them as columns on the far right of the table, and that's okay. But another way of doing it that's equally acceptable is to list the control variables as a footnote. Now, if you list them as a footnote like we have here, then you do not list them as columns. It is crucial that you follow this format when you create all your data tables. Next. Let's take a look at analyzing data. There's several ways we're going to analyze data, and the first way is creating graphs. We create graphs because it's easier to see trends, and they're necessary to develop the math equa equations that show the relationships between our independent and dependent variables. Here's an example of a properly formatted graph. So let's break it down. First, it starts with a title, and graphs are labeled as numbered figures. We do not call them graphs, we call them figures. So your first graph is going to be figure one. Next, it needs to have a descriptive title. My recommendation is whatever the title is for the data table you use to create this graph, you use the same title for the graph. So in this case, we're using the versus format, which is the dependent variable versus the independent variable. Let's take a look at the axes. The dependent variable goes on the y-axis. The independent variable goes on the x-axis. Also, let's look at these titles a little closer. They are titles, so the first letter is capitalized in each word, and we need to include the units. A good rule of thumb is your axes titles should be exactly the same as the column headers from the data table. So for instance, friction force newtons was the column header for the dependent variable on table one, so it's the y-axis title. And similarly, velocity meters per second squared was the column header for the independent variable on data table one. So we need to take a look at our data points, and they should be spread out so they cover most of the graph. We do not want them all scrunched in one corner or one half of the table. Notice they are spread out throughout the graph. You can do this on Logger Pro by auto scaling. Next, we want to draw smooth curves or straight lines through the data, or we don't want to have any curve or line at all. We do not want to draw a straight line from point to point, because if we draw a line, we want it to represent what's going on, and so it needs to be smooth and continuous. So this curve or line may not intersect all the data points and probably won't because of experimental error. So let me just recap when it comes to lines or curves. They need to be a single straight line or a smooth curve that goes through but doesn't necessarily intersect all the data points. Do not draw a series of straight lines from one data point to the next. It is better to have no line or curve than to incorrectly connect the dots with straight lines. Finally, graphs need to be easy to read, so they need to be a decent size. They should cover half the page in portrait orientation or a full page in landscape orientation. Let's move on to our next way of analyzing data, and this is creating linearized test plots.
We won't always have to use this. However, sometimes the original graph is not linear, for instance, in the previous example. And when that's the case, we do need to linearize the graph. And the reason we need to create a linear graph is that's the way we create a math equation from our data. This summary chart will help us figure out what we need to do to our original data to get a linear graph. It's based on first looking at the graph shape, then understanding the relationship, what modification we need to make, and what the math equation will be that comes from that linearized test plot. So here we have three shapes that are possible to see. Let me just state there are other shapes we can see, but these are the three that we'll see most often in our experiments. We have a curve decreasing from left to right. That relationship would be stated as x increases, y decreases, and just a note here, x refers to the independent variable and y refers to the dependent variable. And our conclusion then would be that the dependent variable is inversely proportional to the independent variable. The next curve is one that is increasing from left to right. Here the description would be the dependent variable is proportional to the square of the independent variable. And our conclusion would be that the dependent variable has a quadratic or second order polynomial relationship with the independent variable. Our last curve is one that's increasing from left to right, but the increase is getting slower. It is concave downward as opposed to the previous curve, which is increasing left to right, but is concave upward. So when we have this concave downward curve, the description is the square of the dependent variable is proportional to the independent variable. And so our conclusion would be that the dependent variable has an inverse square relationship with the independent variable. This is also known as the dependent variable obeys the inverse square law. In the sample we've been looking at where we had a graph of friction force on the y-axis and velocity on the x-axis, we had a concave upward curve increasing left to right. So that tells us that the friction force is proportional to the square of the velocity. So we can get a straight, gra a straight line, which we call linearized test plot, if we continue to graph friction force on the y-axis, but instead of plotting velocity on the x-axis, we want to plot velocity squared. This will give us a straight line. And then when we come up with our slope and y-intercept from linear regression, our math equation will be the dependent variable is equal to the slope times the independent variable squared plus the y-intercept. So let's take a look at our linearized test plot. We went ahead and plotted velocity squared on the x-axis, kept friction force on the y-axis, and notice now we have a straight line. And we're going to talk about how we use linear regression to get this slope and this y-intercept. Moving on, Another tool in analyzing data, as I had just mentioned, is linear regression. This will create a math equation from a linear graph, also known as a straight line. We can use LogarPro's linear fit feature, or on Excel, it's the trend line feature to develop this math equation. It's important to talk about what represents a good fit of the data. Because just because these tools on Logger Pro and Excel can draw a straight line through the data doesn't mean that it's a good representation of the data. So if the correlation, which is R, is greater than 0 0.975, or the correlation squared, which is R squared, is greater than 0.95, then we say the data is a good fit 
to the straight line. Or another way of saying it, the line or the math equation that we develop from this line is a good representation of the data. That's just one thing I want to point out, a couple things I want to point out about the correlation. First of all, a perfect correlation would be 1.0, and of course a perfect correlation squared would be also be 1.0. These correlations can be negative or positive. I'm talking about the absolute value of the correlation. Now if you're using Logger Pro, it will give you the correlation R. If you're using Excel's trend line, it'll give you the correlation squared. Once we've run the linear regression, and we've determined that it's a good fit to the data, we need to go about writing the equation with the experiments, variables, and units. So let's talk about some templates. In math, we learned that the equation for a straight line is y equals mx plus b, where m is the slope and b is the y-intercept. However, y and x are just generic symbols. In science, we're actually measuring specific variables. So this math format, y equals mx plus b, our science template is the dependent variable is equal to the slope of the line times the independent variable plus the value of the y-intercept. So that's the general template we'll be using. And from the linearized test plot, we would plug in our specific values for the slope with units and the y-intercept with units and we would put in the specific symbols for the dependent variable friction force and the symbol for velocity in the independent variable. So it's very important when you're writing equations from your experimental data do not use the format y equals mx plus b. You need to list the specific dependent and independent variables, either by name or with symbols, as I've done here, and you need to list the slope with the appropriate units and the y-intercept with the appropriate units. Lastly, we need to check the 5% rule with the y-intercept. And the 5% rule just tests if the y-intercept should really be zero. Now you may say, well, our linear regression gave us a specific value, but we have to keep in mind that we're working with experimental data and data has error in it. No matter how good your procedure is, no matter how careful you are in performing your experiment, you're going to have error. And so if the y-intercept is small enough, in other words, if the line is very close to running through the origin, maybe it really should be at the origin. And the reason it's not is because you have experimental error. Well, that's what the 5% rule tests. And it works this way. You take the ratio of the y-intercept to the largest y-value from your data table. If that ratio is less than 5%, then the y-intercept is really 0. And we're going to ignore it when we write our equation. So let's apply this 5% rule to our example here. The y-intercept from our linear regression was negative 76.88 kilograms meters per second squared, which is also the same as a newton. I, I eliminated the uh, units here because we're just interested in the ratio. Now, we have to put the largest y-value in the denominator. The easiest place to get this is from the data table. So I just went back to table 1 and found the largest value, 96,419. When we do the math, it turns out to be negative 0 0.0008. Now that's the decimal form. That would be 0.08%, clearly less than 5%. Hence, the y-intercept should be 0. And we can simplify our equation to the friction force is equal to 15.07 kilograms per meter times the velocity squared. Let's move on to our last tool for analyzing data, and that's looking at multivariable equations. We have to remember that the linear regression equation only shows how the dependent variable responds to changes in the independent variable. 
in our example, that was the friction force is equal to 15.07 kilograms per meter times the velocity squared. However, often the dependent variable also responds to changes in the control variables. So we'd like to develop a general equation that shows the dependent variable as a function not just of the independent variable, but as a function of all of these variables. Here's a strategy for starting with your linear regression equation and developing a general equation. And this strategy assumes that the slope is a combination of our control variables. In our example, the slope was 15.07 kilograms per meter. Our control variables were the car mass, which we controlled at 1,500 kilograms, and the curve radius, which we controlled at 100 meters. The first step in this strategy, then, is to try different math operations with the control variable units. The units, not the numbers, until you get the same units as the slope. So I took our units, kilograms and meters, and I multiplied them. And of course, that wasn't equal to kilograms divided by meters. Then I took meters and divided them by kilograms, and that's not equal to kilograms divided by meters. And then I took kilograms divided by meters, and of course that's equal to kilograms divided by meters. And bingo, that's the correct math operation that gets the units to match the units of the slope. Now you may be saying, hey, it was obvious, why didn't you go ahead and just do the kilograms divided by the mass right away? And in this case, it was simple and obvious, but sometimes you're going to get more complex relationships, and it truly is just a trial and error process of math operations that get the units to match. Now, step two, we want to confirm this relationship. And to do this, we're going to plug in the numbers for the control variables to see if you get the same numerical value as the slope. So we did, for units, kilograms divided by meters. Well, that's going to be the 1,500 kilograms divided by the 100 meters. And numerically, we get 15. And bingo, that matches the slope with an experimental error of our graph. So the next step, then, is to replace the slope in our equation with this combination of control variables to get the general equation. So the friction force is equal to 1,500 kilograms divided by 100 meters. That gets us the number of the slope and the units of the slope. So in our general equation, we're going to substitute mass for the 1,500 kilograms and radius for the 100 meters. And notice that gives us the equation. The friction force is equal to the mass divided by the radius times the velocity squared. Or you'll more often see it written as mass times velocity squared divided by radius. And that's what we call a general equation. Notice the friction force is written in terms of only variables, not numbers. Now one note here, sometimes the numerical value will be a simple ratio of the slope. In other words, you may have the math operation that gets the units to match the units of the slope, but then when you do this numerical confirmation step, you may find out that the number doesn't match the slope. Rather, it might be half the value of the slope or twice the value of the slope. Sometimes there's some other ratio, but one half or twice are the normal ratios you'll run into. And if that's the case, you simply include the ratio in your general equation. And then remember, the ratio has no units. So this is the strategy for coming up with the general equation. This finishes the section on analyzing data. Now we want to move on to the final step in investigations, which is supporting claims with evidence. Remember, the whole reason we did an investigation was to answer a research question or series of research questions. So we have to recognize that the scientific community requires facts to be proven with data, opinions or statements without proof are not accepted by the scientific community.
So our answer to the RQ, which is called a claim, needs to be proven with our experimental data. There are many ways to write a claim statement or conclusion. Good ones will have the following components. First, it clearly states the relationship between the dependent and independent variables in as much detail as the data will justify. Be as specific as the data will allow you to be. Second, it cites the appropriate tables and figures in your lab report. Third, it gives specific examples of your data that support your claim. Do not, I repeat, do not make the reader go back to the data tables and graphs to find specific examples. Give the specific examples in your claim statement. Let's take a look at what a claim statement would look like for the research question we've been tracking through this podcast. Increasing the car's velocity increases the friction force required to stay on the road. The data in Table 1 shows that a car traveling at 5 meters per second only needs 379 newtons of friction force to stay on the road, whereas doubling the car's velocity to 10 meters per second requires the friction force to be almost quadrupled to 1,511 newtons. The linearized test plot and regression analysis from figure 2 shows that the friction force is proportional to the car's velocity squared. That is, the force of friction is equal to 15.07 kilograms per meter times the velocity squared. Notice this statement meets all three requirements of supporting a claim with evidence. This ends our podcast on the fundamentals of scientific investigation. I hope you found this information helpful.